Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Freddie Garcia, and today we're joined by Dr. David Clark. Uh, Dr. Clark is a chiropractic musician. He is a diplomate from the American Chiropractic Neurology Board. He's also a fellow from the American College of Functional Neurology, a fellow of the American Board of Brain Injury Rehabilitation, a fellow of the American Board of Vestibular uh, Rehabilitation, and a fellow of the American Association of Integrative Medicine and remains one of our highest rated faculty members. Dr. Clark, how are you doing today? Awesome. All right, so today we're doing a, a case review uh, and we're doing a thyroid case review because on February 18th, 19th, and 20th, you have updated and are relaunching your Mastery of Thyroid Brain Access yep. program, which is a super popular class that you did, I think about four years ago, right? Yeah, I think it was four years ago. Yeah, roughly. Yeah, so you said you, you tackled on updating it and adding a bunch of information. Yeah. We shot a video about that not too long ago. Yep. So everybody should know what's going on, but this is a case yeah. review all thyroid based. So you ready to do this? Yeah, let's do it. All right. What do you got for us? All right. So first off, <clears throat> this is not going to be like a mystery diagnosis, right? Because we just said we're doing this to talk to you about the thyroid class. So here we've got a guy, he's 53 years old. He's got a vertigo and diplopia. And the first thing you may think is, if you didn't already know this stuff, is that there's no way that has anything to do with, with the guy's thyroid, right? That's what I would have thought 15 years ago is that, well, there's no way this, this is clearly going to be like MS or it's going to be, uh, you know, it's not going to be the guy's thyroid. Like, how could it possibly be that? Well, let's talk about that and explain why after today, <laughs> uh, even if you never take the thyroid class, I know you're going to, uh, if you never even take the thyroid class, you're going to be changed after watching this. All right. Whoops. Let's see. Let's see if I can get my thingamajig to go. There we go. All right. So what am I going to look for us today? I want us to understand a little bit of physiology. Uh, we're going to how to decipher some symptoms, how to learn what appropriate tests to order. We're going to learn how to think a little bit today. Even in the short time here, we're going to learn how to think. We're going to learn how to, how to do some clinical decision making, how to prioritize what the patient is presenting to us with. We're going to learn how to do follow up because as I make a big point of saying, I think we're probably, I mean, the classes I teach is probably the only program that will actually show you follow up with a patient over six months, nine months, a year, 18 months, because that is when you really know you've done a good job. Too often in this realm of functional medicine or whatever you want to call it, clinical nutrition, whatever, too often what happens is you get given a case and sometimes it's not even a real case. Uh, it's a case and they say, well, here's the diagnosis. Here's what we did and moving on like magic. Well, like, and that's it. Yeah. Like, it's like, that's it. That's all you got to do. Well, I mean, you guys can realize in the real world, that's not how it works, right? Sometimes what you do doesn't work. And sometimes you got to think of another plan. I mean, one of my sayings, I always preach, pre preach to people in the classes is, you know, one plan is nothing, right? Two plans is a plan. In fact, four plans is really a plan, right? Because if all you know is to say, patient comes in with a thyroid problem, I give them iodine. Well, that's nothing. What if that doesn't work? What if that makes them worse? I mean, if you don't know what you're doing and you're not fully trained, you're stuck, right? You're not really serving that patient to the higher level. So that's one of the reasons I want to stop and point out about follow-up. Now, what we don't do, and I'm not even going to teach you this today, is we don't memorize protocols, right? Like we don't say, for every patient that comes in that has X, we give them Y. We don't do that, right? Now, we may find over time that certain patterns of interventions make sense, right? But we have to understand the physiology behind it, right? And to me, I think that's really the, the most important thing there is understanding what is the normal physiology, what is the abnormal, and what are the things that I can do to change and I don't want to say manipulate, but change and affect that, right? And if you just memorize protocols, you don't understand any of that. That's not a good, that's not being a good clinician. It's not being a good doctor, in my opinion. So we're not going to memorize. We're not going to do this for that thinking. And we are not making robots, okay? We're not making little supplement robots. We don't do that. All right, so let's jump into this. So over here on the right, here's what I'm going to start with. You'll see that, I don't know if you guys can see my, yeah, they can see that, yeah? Okay. Yeah, we can see so You see these four, three, two, one. What are those? Well, those are the four neurochemical slash metabolic priorities. And I hit those in extreme detail in the regular six-module neurochemistry class. 
And for our purposes here, I just want you to understand that these are the four things that I use so that I don't get lost, right? So a patient comes in, he's got vertigo and diplopia, right? Well, from a metabolic standpoint, these are the four questions I need to answer to see if they have anything to do with this guy's condition, right? Like you might say on the flip side, you might say vertigo and diplopia, what are the neurological four questions I want to answer, right? Is it a cerebellum problem? Is it a peripheral vestibular problem? Is it, you know, so this is the same sort of thinking, except we're talking about it in terms of metabolic issues, right? And so this is the four things that are on the radar for every patient, including this guy who has vertigo and diplopia. So what is number four? Number four is GI and liver function. Well, he may have some symptoms that point us to that. Uh, he may not have anything with that. There's testing we can do to look at GI and liver function, right? Number three there is cellular energy, meaning HPA axis function and glucose handling. Now, I'm not going to go into all this, but I may kind of just brush on it. But why do we care about this? Well, because you guys both know that a neuron needs fuel and it needs activation. And fuel, one of the big sources of fuel is glucose, right? It's glucose and oxygen. So we care on the metabolic side of things about this. HPA axis has a huge impact on glucose handling, okay? Now, number two is cellular energy, part two, looking at red blood cells, specific nutrients, and mitochondria. Again, why? Because ATP is the name of the game, right? ATP is the name of the game. And so if you don't have enough red blood cells or you're iron deficient or B12 deficient or, B or folate deficient, or your mitochondria aren't doing what they're supposed to do, you're not going to make fuel for the neurons that could be involved in this guy's vertigo and diplopia. All right. Now the last one, and it takes precedence over all the other ones, which is why it's number one, is what we call clinically significant autoimmunity. The reason I say it like that is because lots of people have autoimmune problems that just don't have anything to do with why they're seeing you. It's a mistake to assume that every person that has an autoimmune problem, that that autoimmune problem is why they have whatever they're presenting with, because it's not true. Now, a lot of times it is, I'll just tell you that, but you just can't assume that, which is why I qualify that by saying clinically significant autoimmunity. So those are the four priorities, okay? And we will go over those in the big thyroid class, because I got to give you a little bit of a basis for that. Uh, but if you really want to learn about all those things, that other class, that other series we did is where you're really going to deep dive and learn all those in very fine detail. So with that background in mind, let's look at this guy. So here's his chief complaints. He's got ocular migraines. He has neck pain, double vision, a dizzy feeling as if he's going to faint, tingling on the left side of the neck and the shoulder. He has a sensitivity to bright lights. He loses his balance to his right. So if we just look at that, right, there's some things that may pop to your mind or may not pop to your mind. I mean, I look at that and go, man, that could be a lot of things, right? I mean, he's having a migraine event. That's an autonomic problem, right? He's got double vision. That could be any number of things. That could be a problem with the lens, the retina, uh, you know, the medial longitud longitudinal fasciculus. It could be demyelinating. I mean, it could be, you know, any number of things. It could be a refractive error. The dizzy feeling, well, there's an autonomic problem again, right? So ocular migraines plus this dizzy feeling, that kind of presyncopal feeling, right? The tingling on the left side of the neck and the shoulder, that could be a nerve root kind of problem because he's got neck pain. But just so you guys know, you almost always find people with vestibular problems, they have neck pain. Uh, and there's a reason why that I won't go in. I'm sure the other classes the Kerrigan Institute has does a great job of explaining that, but that's not, that's not an unexpected finding at all. Sensitivity to bright lights, that can be an autonomic problem because if you can't get your pupils to shrink in light, then it hurts. And so a lot of times people that have concussions, they get that pupillary dysfunction where their pupils are too big, which is why they're wearing sunglasses. So maybe that's what this guy has too. He's got a little bit of an autonomic thing happening here. And of course, losing your balance to the right, that could be right cerebellar, right pontomedullary, that could be left midbrain, that could be left cortical. I mean, we don't know, but the guy's obviously got some vestibular type symptoms along with some autonomic symptoms. He also has vertigo, rotational vertigo, that can be positional, meaning he puts in a certain position and it provokes it. Now, that can be a lot of things too. That could be BPPV, that could be a certain canal involvement. 
Uh, it could be an integration problem with information from a certain canal. It happens if he rolls over in bed too quickly. Now that sounds a lot like benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, right? I mean, that, that sounds like that, but we don't know if that's what it is or not. You also know that laying on his right side, now that's interesting, right? Because look, loss of balance to the right, laying on his right side. So if we were trying to like, you know, triangulate where the dysfunction is, it could be on the right side. So that's what this guy's got to begin with. And he also knows that laying prone, laying face down, that evokes nystagmus. So a lot of you vestibular people are already thinking, man, this guy's got, this is a cerebellar vestibular problem. That's what this is. Well, it is, but the question is, is why is it happening, right? Why is that happening? If he moves his head too quickly, it feels like his eyes lag behind. Well, that sounds like a, a low gain of the VOR, right? If I turn my head and then my eyes go, that's why I have a low gain of my VOR. But why is that happening, right? Now, it could be he has what I call just circuit malfunction, right? He's got an integration problem in those vestibulo-cerebellar circuits. But the question is, why is it there? That's what we always want to be asking ourselves is, why is this happening? Why does he have migraines? Why does he have presyncopal problems? Why does he have this vertigo, right? What's going on? Also, if he's been over and turning his head, he can have some vertiginous sensations. Okay, that's not very much different than the other stuff. All right, cool. So... Just so you guys know, if I'm looking at this, right? And then I go, okay, out of these things over here, which of these, if I had to pick one or two, would possibly make the most sense at, at explaining this? Just guessing, right? Well, GI liver function, eh, I mean, not necessarily, not directly. Cellular energy, HPA, yeah. And I'll tell you why, because this HPA thing, that can be this right here, right? hypothalamus pituitary adrenal, the autonomic portion, right? Uh, what about cellular energy? Yeah, I mean, like, look, if you're anemic, that'll make you feel presyncopal too sometimes. Uh, that can certainly cause and provoke migraines. It can certainly also cause uh, cerebellovestibular dysfunction because you're anemic, you're not getting fuel. And for this guy, that could be that, right? What about what clinically significant autoimmunity might be involved here? Well, there's a bunch of things. I mean, he could have MS, right? People with MS get double vision. Uh, they, off, they can get uh, vestibular cerebellar problems. Um, he could have a bunch of different things. So when I look at this at first blush, using my kind of metabolic lens, I go, well, there's some things that this could be, but I don't know yet, right? So we're going to have to learn more. So let's look at his history. So in 1991, and this is one of the things that we're going to teach people, right? So one of the things we do in the thyroid class, the big class, is we do cases, a lot of cases, and we do them just like this. What are the symptoms? What are the symptoms telling us? Here's the history. What is the history telling us? What testing do we need to do, et cetera, which I'll go into in a second. All right, so he had a bad MVA, required some screws in both ankles. He had a hernia, hernia, uh, hernia surgery. Basically healthy into 2015, where one day he'd been over, and then when he returned back to neutral, things felt very floppy, and he couldn't study himself. Well, I mean, that sounds like a guy who probably had some sort of uh, otolithic debris, right, a canalithic debris. He then developed ocular migraines, which have produced zigzag shapes in his left field of vision. So this is not a guy who had migraines his whole life. This is a guy who developed some migraine problems later in life, and he developed them after this kind of vestibular complaint. And if you don't know, there's a big connection between vestibular circuits and autonomic circuits. I mean, huge connection between those. So this is not surprising for us. He said four brain MRIs, because why not? Uh, all been negative. So no one has found any demyelinating lesions anywhere, which is what they're looking for there. They're looking to see, well, this guy, does he have like an arteriovenous malformation? Does he have a demyelinating problem? And that's, that's totally fine to do this, but they're negative. Okay. He's had a couple of chiropractic treatments for his neck pain. He's had two different steroid injections in his neck, which helped for about 10 to 12 days with some of his symptoms. Okay. He's had even had a radio frequency ablation on the right side of his neck. I mean, this guy's neck pain must be pretty bad if he's gone on to ablation. Now, VNG testing that was done a while back initially showed some BPPV. And then he went to Florida. Uh, nobody we know, totally different clinics, not plasticity or any place. Done in Florida, which said, yeah, he's got BPPV. 
I don't know why he had to go to Florida to get that confirmed. I mean, I feel like BBBV is not that exotic, but anyway, that's what he did. All right, so system review. He can't go more than three hours without eating or his symptoms worsen, that lightheadedness. Well, let me just tell you what that means. That means this guy has a problem with the tone of his HPA axis. And without going too deep into it, <clears throat> what's happening is, is his hypothalamus somewhere in the HPA circuit is failing because his glucose is falling, but somewhere in there, either his hypothalamus isn't sensing the hypoglycemia or the signals that the hypothalamus is sending down the rest of that chain are not being responded to because what should happen is his hypothalamus senses the hypoglycemia. I mean, his glucose is falling. And then it sends a signal via the pituitary down to the adrenal glands and cortisol is released on demand, which should then liberate stored glycogen and bring his blood glucose levels back up without him having to eat to do that. But that's not happening. So we know that this guy's got a problem with that HPA axis. We know that. He has alternating constipation and diarrhea. Someone has alternating constipation and diarrhea, there is probably some sort of food sensitivity or GI inflammation happening. Right? You just, that's just not normal. It's not normal physiologically to have alternate constipation and diarrhea. You could walk into most primary care practices and get diagnosed with IBS from that, just those symptoms, right? But again, it doesn't tell us why is that happening? I mean, it could even be brain-based for that matter, but it's probably not. He has afternoon fatigue. That's another classic sign that that guy's HPA axis is not doing what it's supposed to be doing. That really reproducible, you know, very regular, going to happen on a regular schedule every day, about two or three o'clock, I crash, right? And of course, he has those orthostatic hypotensive symptoms. He often wakes up when he's uh, asleep. He tries to go to sleep and he wakes up at night. That's another sign of HPA axis problems. And decreased libido, erectile dysfunction. All right. Now, does that move us any closer towards narrowing down what we think is going on? Well, I mean, the most striking thing of all that is the guy's got an HPA axis problem and he's clearly got erectile dysfunction, right? Now, does any of that have anything to do with thyroid yet? Well, no, not necessarily, but let's keep digging. Now, currently he's taking Herbisartan, which is a blood pressure medication. Hmm. Now I'm interested in that already because this guy's got a lot of hypotensive symptoms. And I can tell you, and you guys can probably just guess this, if I'm taking a blood pressure medication that's for hypertensiveness, then maybe he's taking the wrong medication or too much medication. Maybe that's making him, hypo, uh, making him hypotensive and making him uh, have those orthostatic symptoms. Lorazepam a little bit as needed. Now he doesn't really have anxiety. He takes the lorazepam when his dizziness gets so bad so he can just go to sleep. Hydrocodone as needed as well. Uh, for, as well as protonics. Protonics is not for his neck pain. Protonics is an antacid medication. Now, his family history is significant for a father who is deceased in 2000 due to progressive supranuclear palsy. Well, you know I don't like that. And he's got a first-degree relative with a, who died of a neurodegenerative condition. I'm already thinking, holy crap, what's, could this guy have something like that, right? So what's the impression so far? Well, what could be going on? He could have a peripheral vestibulopathy, right? I mean, he could still have that. He could have a centrally maintained vestibulopathy, right? Meaning it's those integrative circuits centrally, not the peripheral, not a canal problem. Definitely got some dysautonomic stuff, but that could be medication induced. Does he have a metabolic issue? Maybe. I mean, he's got an HPA axis sounding problem. We're going to have to test to find out. So where do you start? I mean, you could start doing anything, right? You could adjust the guy. You could bring him in. You could start doing cerebellar rehab. I mean, you could do all kinds of stuff. So, I mean, you could start doing this kind of metabolic neurochemical workup that I'm going to show you. Uh, you could do receptor-based rehab. You could adjust them or, you know, stick crystals in his nose. I mean, you could do all kinds of stuff, right? But the point is, wherever you start, you have to have a bar set for it. How do I know if what I'm doing is working or not, right? And it can't be six months later, right? That's, that's way, way, way too long, right? If what you're doing with someone is going to work, it should work, whether it's receptor-based rehab or adjusting people or doing metabolic. There's a window of time 
based in physiology that should tell you, yes, this stuff is, this, this intervention is working. So again, here's the four neurochemical priorities. We talked about GI and liver. Uh, does he have any of that? Well, yeah, he's got constipation and diarrhea. What about cellular energy, HP axis, and glucose handling? Without doing any labs, he's got a lot of HP axis tone problems, sound, I mean, symptoms. And if you didn't know that, just trust me. I mean, take, take the other classes. We go over that and explain physiologically why those are symptoms of the HP axis. Uh, does he have a nutrient problem? No way to know that, right? Can't know that from his symptoms, except, you know, he could be anemic and that could be causing these hypotensive symptoms. But we don't know about his nutrient levels based on his symptoms. There's just no way to know that, right? You're going to have to test. Does he have clinically significant autoimmunity? Well, don't know. We, we, there's no way to know that, right? Well, let's find out. So one of the things we always have to ask is what tests are appropriate, right? Because you guys know that you could spend as much money as you wanted doing testing on a patient, right? You could, you could go do stool testing and urine testing and metals testing and candida testing. And I mean, you just whatever you want to do, you could spend money on, but that doesn't make any sense. So appropriate testing depends on, if to me, depends on a couple of factors. Yes, Frank. And Dr. Clark, I think, thank you for bringing up appropriate testing, because one of the things that I've seen in novice people doing neurochemistry type work is when they start and they start learning all this testing, uh, because it's there, they go, let me throw everything at them. Yeah. And then, right. and, then, and then they're literally spending the money of their patients unnecessarily, right? Exactly. So as you exactly. become more educated, you literally go, all right, I, I know actually, because I now have done a better history, better exam, neurophysical, right. now I know I'm going to do this test, this test, not every test just because it exists. Yeah, and just because I don't really know what to do. And so I'm hoping that the tests will tell me what's wrong, right? Just like in neurology and clinical neuroscience, you want your exam to kind of confirm what your working hypothesis is. You don't let your exam, you don't do an exam thinking, I have no idea what's going on, I'm just gonna do an exam. Yeah, let me That's see what comes back. What comes back, yeah, exactly. That doesn't work. So to me, you choosing a test depends on what I call the clinical yield. Like what is that test really going to give you, right? Does it really make sense to do it? The logistics of the test, you know, meaning is it going to be, can, can the patient do that test, et cetera? And then it's the budget. I mean, let's be real, you know, patients don't have an unlimited budget. And as you pointed out, I would rather them spend money on treatment rather than spend money on testing. And that's a little bit different because most of the time in like mainstream medicine, let's call it, the model is you spend a bunch of money on diagnostics and then you do, then you have your prescription to take, right? Well, we're not really going to do that. We're going to try to, you know, we're going to do the testing that needs to be done, but I'll just tell you this. You can treat somebody without tests. Absolutely. You could treat somebody without tests, but it's not very efficient, right? It's just not very efficient because you don't have, you don't have a bunch of stuff that you can rule out. You just have to say, well, okay, let's just start, <laughs> you know? You can do it, but it's not very fun. Um, all right. So again, he's got, he maybe has a chronic vestibulopathy. He had a VNG. Well, what metabolic factors are associated with the vestibulopathy? Well, I can tell you that the things that are associated with vestibulopathy include most likely blood sugar dysregulation, inflammatory problems, and or autoimmune problems. Okay. What about diplopia? Well, that's likely a phenomenon of the vestibulopathy, like the little, the low gain of the, the VOR. What about the lightheadedness and the presyncope? Well, again, he's taking medication that could be doing that. And if it's not the medication, it's an HP axis problem, right? So that could also be an anemia. That could be an iron deficiency. So what testing would you do? Well, I'll just tell you. Blood chemistry? Yeah, absolutely. Why? Well, because I there's there's no way to you're not going to divine it. You're going to have to look and see what are his red blood cell counts. What are his B12, his folic acid, his vitamin D, and his iron, right? You're going to have to know that. So we do a CBC, a comp metabolic and LDH. Now, why would I do the comp metabolic and the LDH? Well, comp metabolic is going to let me look at his liver enzymes and some other stuff. And we're going to let me look at his fasting glucose. This LDH right here, that's lactate dehydrogenase. That's like a surrogate for how much glucose is actually getting into the tissues to be metabolized, okay? And people with lower LDH levels usually have some kind of problem with their HPA axis, 
right? That's why we do that. Uh, lipid panel, I mean, that doesn't have that much to do with this, but we'd still do it because it can be relevant. Certainly want to look at his thyroid because I told you this is going to be a thyroid case, right? You want to check thyroid and check it the right way. <clears throat> so ABS there means full thyroid panel plus antibodies. Now, what's a full thyroid panel? Well, that's TSH, total T4, total T3, T3 uptake, reverse T3, free T4, free T3, thyroid peroxidase antibodies, and thyroglobulin antibodies. A full thyroid panel is not TSH and free T4. I mean, it just isn't. I mean, not, not, by, my, but yeah. not by my book at all. And see, that's so often too. Oh, yeah. I They're mean, like, oh, here's my thyroid panel. And you're like, where's the rest of it? Huh? Yeah, I mean, I just got one back in the day, a, a patient of mine who has uh, Hashimoto's, and the only thing they checked is the TSH. I'm like... <laughs> You can't, that's not even really even valid anymore once you're taking thyroid medication. Anyway, we also want to check his vitamin D, B12 folate, and his ferritin, which is your iron marker, homocysteine to check for oxidative stress. Do I need to do adrenal testing? Let me just tell you, no, I don't need to do that. Even though I said, hey, the guy's got what sounds like low HPA axis tone, do I need to test? No, I've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. They used to do saliva testing, don't do that at all anymore. I've done the urine testing for adrenal function. The symptoms, just, just trust me on this, the symptoms are just as diagnostic as the testing is, right? So I don't, don't need to do it. Stool testing, I mean, I could. I mean, he's got alternating, you know, constipation and diarrhea, but do I need to do stool testing? And in my experience, the answer is no, not in this case. I'm not going to do that. I can do it later if I need to. And I'll tell you why in a second. Now, could I do this thing with him called an immune system challenge? Well, let me explain what that is. That is a cheap way to find out, is this guy's immune system, remember our priority one, is this guy's immune system involved in what's going on with him, right? So an immune system challenge is not something I'm going to explain how to do right now, but I, I do it with people, but only select people. Um, because it's a cheap way of finding out if his immune system's involved without having to do like thousands of dollars of antibody testing, okay? So here's what his lab showed. His lab showed a homocysteine of 10.3. I mean, that's not terrible. Um, and I'll be honest, these ranges might not be totally correct that I'm using. So don't write these down as like the ranges that Dr. Clark uses. Uh, Cause I think I may have pulled this from an old, uh, an old, I may have pulled those and not updated the ranges I use. But nonetheless, that homocysteine is not lab high, but it's, you know, it's a couple points higher than we'd like it to be. Now that right there, the folic acid, that's terrible, okay? From the lab that he used, that is lab low. It is outside that lab's reference range. Their first thought is why? Why is that like that, right? You have to understand, well, okay, well, why, what makes folic acid normal, right? If you don't understand how folic acid, what it's in in the food, how you absorb it, then you don't know what to do when it's low, right? Because yes, I could just say folic acid is low. That's probably why his homocysteine is a little bit high. I'm just going to give him folic acid, pat myself on the back and call it a day. You could do that, but that doesn't get to the root of why is his folic acid like that, right? Oh, look, there's that LDH I was telling you about, right? So that's lab low. That's very, in fact, this guy kind of wins the prize for the lowest LDH I've seen in, the, uh, in all my years. It may have nothing to do with anything, but it's certainly low. And it certainly, to me, leans into that. Well, he's probably got an HPA axis problem. Now, MCHC is a red blood cell indices, and that's low, okay? Mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. Hello, where's my thing? Okay. Ferritin. Now, ferritin is your iron marker. Now, yeah, you might say, well, what about iron? I mean, there's a test called iron, but it's essentially worthless. It only reflects about 1% of your body's iron. Ferritin reflects 22%. So that's the one you look at. This guy's is 60, which is, check this out. I don't know if you guys can see that. The lab range for that lab says, now, 38 to 380 is a super wide reference range. And we could talk for a long time about how reference ranges are made. But let me just tell you that an adult male should not have a ferritin less than 100. Uh, 60 is just too low. And of course, could that be having an effect? Well, yeah. I mean, what do you have to have 
to make energy? Well, you have to have iron. You have to have hemoglobin. So he may not be anemic, but he can have a low enough ferritin that's impacting not only his energy production, but his neurotransmitter function. You have to have iron to make dopamine. You have to have iron to make serotonin. You have to have iron to make thyroid hormones. There's a whole wealth of things that that could be impacted. So I don't want to get too stuck on the reference range, but let me just tell you that that is really a wide reference range. And of course, you know, we have to ask ourselves, why is his ferritin like that? And I'll just tell you that, you know, the number one reason you'll see a ferritin low if the person's not vegan or vegetarian is that uh, they got malabsorption, you know, and the number one cause of malabsorption you'll see is some kind of a gluten sensitivity, not necessarily celiac disease, but I don't want to get too far off of that. So, all right. Now, vitamin D16, that is definitely deficient, right? Deficient. I like my vitamin D and my patients to be at least like, you know, 60. If they have an autoimmune condition that's known, I really want it to be higher than that. 16 is just totally unacceptable. And this is something you see time and time and time again in people that have autoimmune problems is their vitamin D will be low. It's just part of the genetic package. And if you had to say one thing about vitamin D, you would say that it's anti-inflammatory, right? It's immune system regulating. And we don't want anybody's vitamin D to be that low because it's going to cause problems. Now, look at this. TPO antibodies. Well, that's thyroid. That's thyroid peroxidase antibodies. Those are elevated. Uh, that is Hashimoto's. Now, whether his TSH is low or high or normal is going to depend on if we can call it hypothyroid or not. But you know the guy's got an autoimmune problem. Do we know if it's clinically significant yet? Well, not yet, but um, the odds are good <laughs> because his vitamin D is low, his ferritin is low, his folic acid is low. We got malabsorption all over the place. His TPO is high. His reverse T3 is 26.4, which I won't get into that too much in, in this, but we get into that in the class. Uh, and so what you've got here is you've got a guy who has high reverse T3, but the remainder of the thyroid numbers, the TSH, the T4, the T3s, they're euthyroid, meaning they're normal. So if you had to call this guy anything, you would say he has euthyroid Hashimoto's. And I'll just tell you from my personal experience and from what's in the literature, this could be a big player in this guy's vestibular dysautonomic presentation. So let's just kind of summarize what we've got here in the context of our kind of our four priorities. So we've got a homocysteine, Here's the folic acid. I'm going to burn through those. Not have to go through much again. There's his ferritin. Okay, very good. Now, which of those relate to priority number four, GI and liver function? Well, none of them. <laughs> so it doesn't really have anything overtly going on with his liver and nothing on the, on the blood work that overtly relates to GI function. All right. What about which of these have anything to do with cellular energy, HPA access, and glucose handling? Well, the one you want to look at is this guy right there, that lactate dehydrogenase, because that's low. And typically speaking, if it's below 140, you're probably looking at someone who's not getting enough glucose into their tissues. And there is a difference between blood glucose and tissue glucose. It's very hard to test tissue glucose, but pretty easy to test blood glucose. Lactate dehydrogenase is kind of a surrogate marker for how much is getting into the tissues. Okay, this could be a, uh, a good marker for this guy's ability to get glucose into the places it belongs. All right, I don't know what happened just there. Let's try that again. Okay, now, what about red blood cells, nutrients, mitochondria? Well, you know, ferritin's one of those. His ferritin, we just talked about it, is way too low. We know that his homocysteine here is a little too high. And it's probably too high because of his folic acid level. Uh, without jumping into it too much, homocysteine is a big marker for oxidative stress. And you recycle homocysteine. And we go over this in the other classes. But you recycle homocysteine through the remethylation cycle, also known as the methionine cycle, a lot of different names for it. But anyway, B B12 and folic acid are your two big nutrients that do that. And this guy's B12 markers were normal, but his folic acid was not. So this is probably the culprit for why his homocysteine is too high. And we know that without adequate ferritin, you're going to have a hard time making ATP. 
right? We also know that that mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration is low, meaning without enough iron, he's starting to get uh, pale cells, right? Pale red blood cells, but he's not anemic yet. All right, apparently I did a great job with the animations on this. Let's keep going. <laughs> Da, 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 da. What about the clinically significant autoimmunity? Well, yeah, we are talking about the vitamin D that is super related to autoimmunity because if that, I always tell my patients, if you give me a hundred people with a known autoimmune problem, 99 of them are going to have a vitamin D deficiency unless they're supplementing. Like it's that common. And of course, we talked about this guy's TPO antibodies. Now, as I think I get to a little bit later, TPO antibodies are kind of interesting. They can not only direct your immune system to attack your thyroid peroxidase, but these TPO antibodies can also attach to your cerebellum. They can attach to your Purkinje cells in your cerebellum and direct your immune system to attack not only your thyroid, but to attack your cerebellum. And thyroid peroxidase antibodies can also attach to astrocytes in the brain, which are a, a type of glial cell. So this may be a big deal for this guy. This may have nothing to do with what this guy is doing. Uh, we're just going to have to treat them and find out. All right. So is he autoimmune? Yes. Now, I'm just going to say something about this. There's, when you're talking about autoimmunity, there's the question of, do you need to know the specific antibody? Because this guy has a specific antibody. We checked it. Or do you just need to know that he has some kind of autoimmune problem? Well, it'd be great to have a specific antibody, but sometimes you don't have that luxury. So you can do antibody testing, which I was just referring to, which will give you specific antibody results. But I'll just tell you, you can spend 10 or $15,000 checking specific antibodies. Sometimes you just gotta know, is the immune system involved? So the antibody testing is specific, but it's expensive. It's not encyclopedic. It's not the be all end all because sometimes people have antibodies that you're just not checking, right? They're there, you're just not checking for them. Now there is this thing called a clinical challenge, which I'm not gonna tell you how to do, but that's basically where you kind of shake the beehive, right? You kind of boost their immune system one way and then another way, and you kind of see how they respond. And I'll just tell you that doing that clinical challenge is uh, very, very reliable in answering the question, is this patient's immune system involved? It can't tell you the name of a condition. It can't give you the name of an antibody, but in a down and dirty brass tax, $25 cheap kind of way, it can answer that question, is the patient's immune system involved? Now, this guy, we did a clinical challenge, and here's what happened with this guy. He felt really good after ingesting what's called T-helper-1 or TH1 cytokine stimulators. He felt pretty good, felt better. He had no response to T-helper-2 cytokine stimulators. So I'll just tell you, that doesn't tell us much. You know, If he'd felt really bad after one of them or felt like super vestibular after one of them, then I would have said, well, you know, then that would give us more evidence that maybe, you know, this uh, immune system is involved, but we're still probably going to treat him like he's got an autoimmune problem because he does. And we're going to see what happens. So again, low HPA axis tone, very likely. And by the way, I'm not saying adrenal fatigue because adrenal fatigue is uh, not a term you should be using because that's a term that was coined uh, several years ago by a guy in a book, but there's nothing in the literature that uses the term adrenal fatigue or uses it consistently, et cetera, et cetera. That's the term you want to use, low HP axis tone. So that's in another class. He's got a need for folic acid. He's got a high oxidative stress. He's got a vitamin D deficiency. He has a need for iron. And he's got euthyroid Hashimoto's. All right, cool. What's the treatment plan? Well, again, I'm not going to give you piece by piece what it is right now because it'll just take too long. And I don't want you running off thinking every person that has Hashimoto's gets this because that's not how it works either. But categorically, what we did diet-wise, we used an anti-inflammatory diet, okay? For a supplement protocol, we used an anti-inflammatory supplement protocol, which had things in it like vitamin D and folic acid and omegas and some other stuff. But the point is, we wanted to correct specific nutrient needs, deal with the inflammatory problem, the autoimmune problem that he has, and find out does it have any bearing on his vestibular and dysautonomic presentation. So... 30 days after doing an anti-inflammatory diet, which is gluten-free, dairy-free, grain-free, a bunch of other stuff free, he says, man, I feel 80% better. Now, yeah, that's a subjective report. I get it, right? But for somebody to say in 30 days, they feel 80% better, you got to listen to that. I mean, could it be placebo? I mean, yeah, sure. But I mean, 80% is a big deal. 
over the last six days, he's been, this is after me following up with him here, for the six days prior to me following up with him, he'd been off his blood pressure medication entirely, didn't need it. On 825, he had a pretty significant dizzy spell, went to the emergency room. The day after he was feeling the same and in consultation with his doctor, decided to reduce the blood pressure medication because he doesn't need it. That's what led to him getting off of his blood pressure medication is the doctor said, look, your blood pressure is not high anymore. So that's cool. So we know we're having some impact on him, right? Uh, the, the positional vertigo he was getting, that really hasn't happened. Now, granted, he was having that pretty frequently and he says, I can't really remember that happening. So that's exciting. And the ocular migraine, he hadn't had one of those since I talked to him the last time. Also pretty exciting. Now, are we just gonna wrap it up right here? This is it, right? That's it, we're done. 30 day follow-up, home run. You gotta go Everything's further. Great. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> now, in terms of his vision changes, the radical vision changes he was having aren't happening. Uh, he's been having just a few little kind of little blurriness occasionally in his vision. So about a, about a month later, okay, uh, the last time I spoke to him, this is so this is 60 days into treatment, right? He said he was about 80% better. He says, man, I'm having no positional vertigo, no ocular migraines, no vision changes. So that's probably not placebo because usually there's a washout with placebo, right? They feel, they feel better. And then as time goes by, that kind of washes out and they go back to the way that they were. The only thing that's really hanging around is that hypotensive feeling when he lays down or if he gets up. That could be related to the fact that his ferritin is still too low or his LDH is too low. So we're going to have to recheck, right? We've got to recheck his blood markers. So I don't retest blood markers every 30 days. You shouldn't do that either. There's no reason to do that. But we are going to recheck them. On the, so about, about 60 days after he started his protocol, his ferritin was 38. Whoops. It used to be 60. Well, that doesn't look good, right? Well, let me just tell you what that is. It doesn't mean that we hurt him by giving him the stuff we were giving him. It could be that the guy's ferritin was actually lower than we thought because ferritin is an acute phase reactant. And in people who are inflamed, their ferritin levels can rise independent of what their iron status is. So sometimes what you'll see in someone is you'll do an anti-inflammatory protocol and their ferritin levels will drop, but then their ferritin levels will go back up over time. Folic acid is maxed out, so he's going to reduce his folate dosage. He's totally absorbing the folate we're giving him, which is awesome. His LDH, unchanged. So maybe what we're doing has no impact on that. Maybe that's not a player, but it hasn't changed. Hey, his vitamin D has gone up 62 points. That's, he can absorb the vitamin D supplementally. That's good. So I said, hey, you know what? you were on that anti-inflammatory diet, why don't we start adding back some of the stuff you'd been eliminating like nuts, beans, seeds, eggs, et cetera, but we're only gonna do it one item every four days. Um, and I won't go over that right now, but we go over that in the class. Basically what we're doing is saying, hey, I'm not gonna do a food IgG test because those basically don't measure what you think they measure. Why don't we just eliminate some foods that are pro probably problematic, then we'll reintroduce them. And if he has a problem with them, then that'll tell us that he has a problem with that food and probably also tells us he has an issue with his gut being hyperpermeable, et cetera. Again, another topic we'll talk about in the class, but that's why we're doing, that's why I'm doing the diet that way. And we're going to recheck his, his ferritin and LDH in about 30 days and see if his ferritin moves or not. All right, so in December, his blood work showed LDH 76. Okay. All right, so gone up about 12 points. I mean, that's still nowhere near where it needs to be, but you know, it's gone up at least. His ferritin, look at that, his ferritin's gone up to 64, right? So can I prove for sure that that whole fluctuation was due to inflammation? No, but this is something I've seen a bunch of times. But 64 is better. Still, no, listen guys, this is like almost four months into this and he's still having no positional vertigo that he was having all the time, right? He's had a couple of ocular migraines recently, but he thinks that's specifically related to his neck, which it can be. We all know that there's trigeminal pathways that integrate all that stuff. So yes, he could be having uh, eye pain in a migraineous fashion that's connected to his neck, right? He's had a few lightheaded symptoms when lying down or getting up, but really not very many at all. So this dysautonomic stuff is looking pretty good. He introduced eggs, pinto beans, 
uh, potatoes, no problem. I, hey, well, let's start eliminating some of the supplements and see how you do without that, right? Let's just, look, you're doing good. I always view this stuff as rehab, right? You don't just do rehab forever. You have to, at some point, find out, well, have I done what I needed to do? Because the way I look at it is like this. If I can rehab the system, I'm going to rehab it. If I can't rehab it and I have to help him compensate by taking stuff long term, then we'll do that. But I need to prove that that's the path that I need to take, right? All right. Uh, fall of growth for a month, et cetera. Okay. So into January of last year, right? Uh, he's not been using two of the supplements, the two big uh, anti-inflammatory supplements for almost five full weeks. He's been uh, without a third of the, the other ones for four days, not feeling any worse. That's good. We like that. All right. Interviewed some of that. He's been using a protein drink, et cetera. We're going to recheck some other labs, try to add back some more foods. This guy's doing good, right? This guy is doing good. He's not having positional vertigo. He's really not having ocular migraines. He's really not having dysautonomic symptoms. So it looks like we might be on the right path. So February, now he's taking thyroid hormones. Because remember, we said that he had U-thyroid Hashimoto's. Well, back where he lives in his, lo uh, his local doc decided that his TSH number, which we'll talk about in the class, was starting to move a little too high, indicating he needed to take replacement hormones. So he's doing that now, okay? And that's extremely common with people that get U-thyroid Hashimoto's is eventually they transition into overt hypothyroid and they need to be taking thyroid uh, hormones. He's introduced all, the, uh, introduced all these foods with no problem, but green beans cause him a skin breakout. Well, guess what? He's not gonna eat green beans, right? That's my food sensitivity test, right? Is he introduced that, caused a problem, we're not gonna have it. He did some stem cells in his neck, feels that's certainly helping. But look, in terms of his original chief complaints, the only thing that's happened since I spoke to him in January of 2019, okay, this is 2020 with this follow-up is here, is he's had a few millisecond episodes of a little bit of rotational feeling when rolling over to his right. So that's probably not BBPV, right? Because if you just have like a millisecond or two, that's, there's no latency to that. It, that's probably not BBPV. That's probably a, a canal integration problem through the cerebellar and vestibular uh, nucleus, probably what that is. Now, blood chemistry from the 4th of February 2020 showed vitamin D85 looking good, LDH84 slowly creeping up. Ferritin 40, what the hell? This guy's ferritin's down again. He has got a problem absorbing iron, and it may be that I need to switch him to a different form of iron. He's been using a capsule form, but that doesn't seem to be working. So I said, hey, let's switch from the capsule iron. There's a liquid form I use. Different manufacturer, right? I was, in fact, just talking to somebody uh, yesterday about that, how, like, you know, most supplement companies try to have everything. Like they've got a GI stuff and a cardio stuff. And, but the thing is, is they're not going to have the A plus number one for everything. It's just impossible. So you, you need to be able to pick and choose what works the best for an individual patient. You need to be able to have your first choice, your second choice, and your third choice. Because sometimes stuff's out of stock. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes they're sensitive to whatever it is. And you just have to be able to have your choices. So anyway, let's continue the rest of everything else. 60 days, we're going to recheck his ferritin. And if his little millisecond stuff doesn't improve, we're going to do some uh, brain-based rehab to kind of fix that calibration issue, All right? So that's February, 2020. June, 2021, that's four months later. Took him that long to get the retest done. He's had no vestibular symptoms at all since I talked to him in February, right? So this guy is doing very well. Every now and then his neck causes him problems. He'll go to see his local chiropractor and get adjusted. His blood chemistry on 6-2 showed normal CBC. TPO antibodies are still high, but you know they will do that. Now, I'll tell you one thing this guy hasn't done is there is something you can take, and I'll leave it as a mystery. There is something you can take long-term that has been shown literature-wise and clinically to lower TPO antibody levels and sometimes normalize them. Okay, But that doesn't mean that they're all better it means that their TPO antibodies are normalized. And granted, we want TPO antibodies to be as low as we can get them because 
as I said earlier, there's a cross reaction potential that happens. So we don't want someone's antibodies to be like crazy high. And there is something you can take and we'll talk about it in the class. His D is looking good, B12 looking good, comp metabolic looking good. But I said, dude, we still need to see your ferritin. <laughs> so he's gonna keep using his iron, vitamin D, folic acid, omega-3 fatty acids. That's kind of his little core protocol. So let's check back on him in September of this year, right? It was June, September. So what we got? Hey, ferritin 141. Now that I can live with. So the liquid iron is probably what got his ferritin to finally go up where we wanted it, right? Now, here's the thing. You're going to see people with Hashimoto's, and this is known, people with Hashimoto's will often have elevations in homocysteine, deficiencies in iron, vitamin D, folic acid, and B12. You're going to learn in the class how to recognize those correctly on lab work how to supplement those, how to follow up and find out if it's working and what to do if what you're giving them doesn't work, right? That's kind of completing the whole sort of loop. And then ultimately you've got to figure out, you know, why is it not, you know, why, why are they deficient? Is it a sequelae from the autoimmune problem? Are they vegan? Do they not make enough stomach acid, et cetera? So, so there's his previous historical readings in case you guys were, were wondering, 40, 64, right? So that's significant. That, that's a good level. We like that. And then a week later, man, I'm doing great and feeling great. He's a hay farmer, right? He grows hay and like uh, takes it to places where they have horses. <laughs> so anyway, but he's doing really good. So that is a longitudinal long-term follow-up on a guy who presented with diplopia, vertigo, dysautonomic symptoms. And we never touched his vestibular system with our hands or, any, or eye movements or tilts or anything. We went for it because we said, you know what? The guy's got a metabolic issue. It's Hashimoto's. Let's treat him and see what works. He's got nutrient deficiencies. Let's treat those and see. And in this guy's case, it, that's what worked for him. All right. So what are the takeaways that I want you to think about from that case? Well, you need to know and own the relevant physiology in order to be efficient and effective, right? You don't want to just start giving this guy anti-yeast supplements right? Or tell him that he's got a mercury problem because the odds are he probably doesn't, right? Now, there may be somebody who does have those things and presents with the same exact symptoms, but this guy didn't have that. You want to do testing that makes sense based on that case. Don't just have a, every patient that comes in gets these 10 tests and it's $5,000. Don't do that. That wastes their money. It's not making you a good doctor and you're going to chase down a bunch of red herrings because if you do enough tests, you're going to find something that's wrong but it doesn't mean it has anything to do with what they came in with, right? So do testing that makes sense based on that case and learn those four priorities, both in the thyroid class and in the other neurochemistry classes to help you prioritize your treatment, how not to get lost and always think what's next, right? You have to know what nutrients, herbs, supplements cause the desired changes in physiology, right? That's why you don't memorize a little protocol, you understand right? You know, it's like, uh, well, I'm not going to say it anyway. And you want to integrate brain-based uh, treatment when appropriate and indicated, right? So if this guy's little millisecond stuff hadn't been improved, we were going to rehab it, but it did. It went away. Now, that being said, let me give you a couple of the literature things to kind of ground you and why I knew what to do with that guy, right? Vestibular disorders in youth thyroid patients with Hashimoto's, right? This is a, this is a paper. 52% of Hashimoto's patients showed an alteration in VEMPs. Now, VEMPs are vestibular evoked myogenic potentials that basically check your otolithic function, right? 52% of Hashimoto's patients had an, had an abnormal VEMP. 44% had an alteration of a caloric test. You guys don't know what that is, right? The hot air, the cold air, the water, looking to see if you can induce a, a, a current. 44% had a, an abnormal caloric test but a correlation was found between those alterations and the degree of their TPO antibody levels. So if the levels are higher, they're gonna have more vestibular dysfunction. It has nothing to do with their age or if their TSH is low or high, All right? The absence of thyroid autoimmunity alters and reduces the risk of vestibular alteration. So if you've got thyroid autoimmunity, vestibular stuff should be on your radar. So the conclusion I've highlighted, I like this conclusion. 
In youth thyroid Hashimoto's patients, a significant relationship between subclinical vestibular damage and the degree of TPO antibody titer was documented. This finding suggests that circulating antithyroid antibodies may represent a risk factor for developing vestibular dysfunction. An accurate vestibular evaluation of Hashimoto's patients with or without symptoms is warranted, right? So you have a Hashimoto's patient, learn how to evaluate their vestibular system, either with instrumentation or clinically or something, it's gotta get done. All right, that's from seven years ago. What about Hashimoto's, Meniere's, and BBPV? Well, patients that have Meniere's disease have a significantly higher prevalence of positive thyroid antibodies compared to healthy controls. More than 50% of Meniere's patients had either Hashimoto's or other non-organ-specific antibodies like uh, anti-nuclear antibodies, ANA. People with BPPV had significantly higher TSH levels and thyroid antibody levels compared to controls. And almost 20% of youth thyroid Hashimoto's patients had signs of BPPV. So there's your intersection of thyroid autoimmunity and vestibular stuff. I like this. In, ha in Hashimoto's patients, the presence of even slight symptoms or signs potentially related to vestibular lesions should be carefully investigated. But here's the thing. You're not just going to investigate it. You're going to fix it. You're going to treat these people. And in most of the cases, they're going to do a lot better when you start bringing to bear the tools you need to modulate their autoimmune problem, which you're going to learn in the class. All right. Um, ba -ba -ba. Thyroid autoimmunity should always be checked. And the people with BPPV in recurrent BPPV, uh, subclinical autoimmune Hashimoto's has to be taken into account, even if it's your thyroid. All right, Hashimoto's, I like the little fireworks. Um, basically, I'm just gonna go through, you guys understand that. Okay, 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 da, da, da. all right. Do, 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 do. Okay, the histories of goiter, hypothyroidism, or hyperthyroidism were associated with Meniere's disease, okay? So there's just more information connecting the two. In subgroup analyses, hypothyroidism was associated with Meniere's in women under 65. Hyperthyroidism was related with Meniere's in women overall, despite age. So there you go, thyroid and vestibular, okay? That's one slice of what we're gonna be talking about in the class because uh, there's lots of things like this. There's thyroid and depression, thyroid and psychosis, thyroid and Parkinson's, thyroid and anxiety, thyroid and bipolar, right? Okay, we're going to skip that. Uh, dysregulated thyroid hormone levels may also be implicated in the associated, association of Meniere's with thyroid. Okay, so I just want to say a couple, well, a couple more things. So Hashimoto's, if you ask most people about it, they say, well, you know, it's a thyroid problem, you gain weight. But it's actually a little more than that. And that's what I'm trying to communicate with my skull and crossbones and my danger sign. It is dangerous. The annual incidence for women is 3.5 cases per 1,000. So you get 1,000 women, 3.5 cases. So if you've got a city of a million people, right, you got quite a few Hashimoto's cases in there that are, that are actually uh, uh, diagnosed. Women are six to eight times more likely to develop the disease than men. It occurs especially between 40 and 60, but you can see it in any age group, including kids. So you always got to be thinking about it. Hashimoto's is now considered the most common cause of hypothyroidism in the areas of the world where dietary iodine is sufficient. And let me just say, I know someone's looking at this saying, but Hashimoto's is caused by not enough iodine. No, it's not. That's not what causes Hashimoto's, okay? Giving, taking in too much iodine will give you Hashimoto's. That's one of the things we'll talk about in the class. So for now, let me just tell you that uh, Hashimoto's is not caused by deficient iodine and you take too much iodine, you're going to give yourself Hashimoto's if you have the genotype for it. Uh, and you're can easily, easily make your Hashimoto's worse. Okay. It's the most frequent autoimmune disease. Think about that. Hashimoto's is the most frequent autoimmune disease. And it's obviously one of the main endocrine disorders. Uh, if it's one of the most frequent autoimmune diseases. So it is dangerous. It's related to a lot of other conditions. So we just talked about a guy that had vertigo and diplopia and dysautonomia, but it's also related to PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, 
infertility, miscarriages, preterm deliveries. Now, granted, those aren't necessarily brain conditions, but vestibular dysfunction certainly is. It's uh, related to Meniere's and other autoimmune conditions specifically, like people with Hashimoto's will end up, uh, that it won't, I'd say this like it's definite, but they often end up getting other autoimmune conditions like intrinsic factor antibodies or parietal cell antibodies, pancreas autoimmunity. I got a lady right now who's here seeing me from the Middle East who's got had a raging case of type one diabetes and developed Hashimoto's from it. Now she has a cardiomyopathy. Um, so yeah, it, it can really do some nasty stuff to you. Cerebellar dysfunction, if not just destruction, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. And I say all of that to lead into, that's the stuff that we're gonna be talking about at the Mastery of the Thyroid Brain Axis that Freddie was uh, talking about. We got a lot of stuff to talk about, but. What you saw me do today, that's what you're going to learn how to do is how to recognize, hey, this person might have a thyroid problem. How, what tests do I do to analyze that appropriately? Depending on what the tests are, what do I do? How do I know if it's working? How do I follow up? All right. Um, and I guess that's where I'll stop. What else do you want to say, Freddie? <clears throat> Nothing. I just, Dr. Clark, I want to thank you for your time. To all those who made it to the end of the video, we appreciate you watching the entire video. And if you've been considering adding clinical neurochemistry work, hopefully you appreciate the communication style that Dr. Clark has, which is very straightforward. I mean, there's a reason he's one of our highest uh, rated faculty members. He's no fluff. He's going to tell you what you need to know. He's going to be honest about it. He's going to tell you what works for him and train you to make decisions about what's going to work for you. He's not yeah. going to give you a recipe and say, oh, this is what's going to work every single time. He's going to teach you to think, be an actual clinician. And then give you the tools and then so then you could pick the right tool out of the toolbox right, right? and i think that's very very different as opposed to going to other educational programs that are like well we're going to teach you to use our supplement line because i got to tell you i've been to a lot of courses i have a master's in nutrition i've done a lot of those when i was a student and uh it seldom very seldomly works it's just it really becomes a vehicle for for the product line and i never felt that was um I, honestly, ethical is the right word. I never felt that was ethical, which is why I appreciate, Dr. Clark, what you've been doing for years and why you have a big following here at the Carrick Institute. So to everybody who's wondering at home, what, you know, why he's one of the best, this is why he's one of the best, he's going to tell you what works. Thyroid, there's so many people suffering. It's, oh, yeah. not, uh, it's not uncommon. No. You know, so, so, so if you're thinking about dipping into your pool into applying nutrition and neurochemistry, thyroid is a great initial condition. Yeah. Um, if you're already in it and you want to become a specialist in this, then this is the program for you. It's yeah, basically, absolutely. this is what you need to know. It's on the screen. It's February 18th, 19th, 20th. We're having it live stream. So internet live stream, you could watch it from your couch. We're going to record it for self-paced digital learning. And we are having, a, we have a few seats left for the on-site training as well. So we're going to allow some people in the room because there is some physical exam, neurological yep. exam, because yep. you're, you're not only teaching the thyroid, but you're going to talk about the brain connections and what yep. happens there, which exactly. again, nobody else is really trained enough to the point to even do that unless you have the man, which is Dr. Clark. <laughs> hey, what are you still doing the... Um... The, are you still doing like the lifetime access and all that stuff and like the yeah it's, it's that? called it's called all access all the people you know we've had a large amount of people attend this program in the past uh if they have active accounts with us still which is you know one course a year or they pay a 150 dollar technology fee like kind of like a college uh because we actually are a college now um yeah, then true. uh <clears throat> it's true right it's a, a long time coming uh then they get to reattend uh for free it's an audit so they don't get the, uh, the course hours uh, the neurology hours again, right? It's kind of like, uh, I always say this, I go, it's like, uh, you can't take math 101 20 times and, and make believe you're eligible for a master's right. degree in math, right? right. So you get to right. audit the course, get the updated information, which Dr. Clark has in there for you. Um, the most you'll pay is for a new, a new uh, manual, if there's even that. Uh, so for those who are considering this, you're buying a lifetime of education. Your, your right. tuition is, hey, in three years, five years, when we do this again with Dr. Clark and there's new updates and new research and you say, oh, I, I don't want to spend 100 hours going through it. Well, guess who's doing it? Dr. Clark's doing that every day. Those books right. behind him, those books behind him, those are real. Those aren't like an Ikea display. Right, you know, it's, he, it's, he, it's he, not I, a Zoom background. These are real books, right? Yeah, so, so you, have a, you have a person, a brilliant clinician doing that for you. So again, your tuition actually goes a very, very long way, which is why, you know, care kids programs are very popular and specifically Dr. Clark's programs are very, very popular. Um, Dr. Cool. Clark, anything else before we go? 
No, man, I hope you guys, I uh, hope you guys join us and uh, get ready, man. It'll, it'll change. I mean, there's so many people that have these problems. It, it, it really will transform, not like in a Tony Robbins way, but like it will really change for the better your efficacy with people, uh, the kind of results you get. You'll be more efficient. I mean, it'll, you'll get a lot out. Of it. I, I can't wait for just to see how you guys incorporate it and grow with it. It'll be great. Beautiful. So if you want to be, uh, if you want to reach that level, carrickinsu.com. We hope to see you at the course, either online or in the classroom. Have a great day, everybody. Bye, Dr. Clark. See ya.